first speaker is Dave Stoney uh, with Stoney Forensics in Virginia. And the title of his presentation is Time to Rethink Death. Thank you, Will. Um, this is a, a work that I'll be talking about that's uh, got an aspect of uh, reconsidering things from sort of a theoretical or, or maybe a very hopeful perspective, and also an aspect that introduces a, a work, a research work that we're now doing uh, with the assistance of the National Institute of Justice. The traditional focus for forensic particle trace evidence is on comparative analyses and specific target particle types. Uh, fibers, glass, paint, you know, as opposed to looking at all the particles that are present in a sense of trying to exploit all the particles that are present. That is a good, correct, necessary, appropriate approach as far as I'm concerned. But one thing it has done is it's narrowed our perspective in some respects, and I want to sort of push the envelope in that, uh, in that direction. So my motivation is to rethink this using all the dust that's present as opposed to, well, in addition to the targeting uh, materials that we're looking at. We have this problem that we've been chasing for, for years. The traces are from mass-produced manufactured materials. And we see in the, the work that's being done on glass is pushing that to the limit in a beautiful way of milking everything you can get out of this sort of thing. But you still have a fundamental limitation uh, to this to class associations, what to many highly discriminative levels, but still class associations. And then there's these issues relating to trying to make a, a judgment of the strength of the association, or particularly to quantitate it. And in uh, 1996, at what I consider the first one of these symposia, I gave a presentation, and, and Ed Bartik gave a presentation and we were looking at the use of databases, and we were contrasting what you can do in trace evidence with what the folks were doing in um, serology, I guess it was a DNA. The, um, and in, look, in trying to create a database that's relevant to the interpretation of your evidence, one of the points I made is, well, look, you need a standard method first, because if you're going to have things in the database, you have to standardize your methodology in order to use that. And then very importantly, you need to decide what's the relevant population. Fine for something like individuals and human beings and blood, but very complex when you go to trace evidence. And then our focus is on extremely rare events, at least the way we traditionally approach forensic trace evidence. We want to look for methods that are highly discriminating, and that gets us into this syndrome of trying to not only use highly discriminating methods on one type of particle, but also then predict how frequently it occurs. And that's been something that's been on my mind for, for some time. I decided I'd name this the individuality uncertainty principle in forensic science. The smaller the frequency, the larger the population we need to estimate it. Our population is small with uncertain heterogeneous composition. And we can't test or reliably predict frequencies of those rare events. So it's thrown out there as a principle, something to be debated, and maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but I believe it's uh, a fundamental problem for us. I stated this slightly differently in 1991. I said that our provable probabilities will be much, much more common than either our good science or common sense will allow. And it translates to this conundrum with decreasing reliability of frequency estimates with increasing evidential value. Now, I strongly suspect that as things move forward in decision-making theory and in the forensic statistics area, that some of these rather simplistic views will probably be modified, but I propose that as a principle that we can at least talk around. More motivations to rethink dust. Changes in forensic science practice. Two very important ones, technical progress, computer-assisted analytical methods, and data processing capabilities. We've seen changes in our daily lives relating to these things. There are changes in our instrumentation that we use for trace evidence analysis. It's naive of us not to think that the future of trace evidence analysis is going to very significantly be changed by the amount of data that can be processed and the amount of processes that can be automated. Uh, Claude 
foreshadowed this in 2007. He asked the question, when will we uh, go to ever reach the next level in, um, in forensic science to trace evidence? There's also professional changes, and these, I debated whether to call this a regression or changes. I, I stuck with changes. Standardization of methods and routine analyses being things that are expected of us. Increased specialization. Reduction of subjectivity. Gosh knows what that's going to do to visual microscopy when that hits. Accreditations and certifications and pressure to get more scientific or more like other scientific disciplines. And we have greater community interest. Uh, scientists, legal community, and public are paying attention to us now. Um, so there's also some clues, though, to guide a new approach that, I, uh, that uh, at least make me want to rethink dust, but also say, hey, look, there's some, something we could maybe do here. We've got these, reiterating a little bit, the, the interpretations issues that might guide a new approach. We've got a limitation of class association. The second one, a case-specific systematic variations that can't be controlled. What I mean by that is when you try to interpret your um, or quantitatively interpret the significance of your evidence in the case context, what might be um, this bit of trace evidence occurs with a frequency of about one in 200, then you get things, well, what about in this neighborhood? What about at this particular type of case? What about a transfer of 50 of those fibers? We, we get case-specific things which comp make it more complicated all the time. And then we have this individual uns individuality uncertainty principle that I, I named. Along with that, we've got compellingly strong evidential value. When we see the cases like David Floor presented, you know, what, this, you don't need statistics for this stuff. My gosh, you got multiple transfer evidence. It's, uh, it's as compelling uh, as it could possibly be in terms of decision making and proof. And you got cases with many layered taints where they're not correlated for any reason at all. So we have the ability to get to extremely high probative value um, and uh, we're not limited to class associate. Well, wait a minute, we are when we look at one particle. But when we look at many particles, we, we get there. We get there the same way that, um, that other folks do. The soil analysis is another clue. We've got issues and approaches that arise from combinations of small particles. Now, some of the variation that we see there would be deterministic, would be controlled by one thing or another, would be highly correlated. Uh, so if I've got a soil that uh, has a particular bedrock, it's going to have particular types of minerals that are all ought to occur in about the right certain ratios or more restricted ratios of, of abundance. On the other hand, you've got things coming in there from the garden and the human intervention and the um, anthropomorphic particles. So those are, are um, a stochastic process. They've got no reason. To, they can't, they have to be viewed as being uncorrelated. One more set uh, clue to guys. We've got this. Um, in DNA analysis, we have accepted theory and methodology to calculate joint probability. They're not getting to it by proving that there's one rare substance. Me eventually they might if they sequence a whole genome, but they're getting it from a set of modestly rare occurrences. And they can put reliable bounds on the frequency that those occur and the correlation between them. So multiple transfers of a set of moderately rare particles could do the same thing for us. And they do all the time, we're already doing it. But they can break the barrier of class association. And they can address this individuality uncertainty principle as that we can now measure their frequencies of occurrence and their correlation. So where do we get those sets of particles? It's fine in that case that comes with the multiple transfer evidence of the multi-layered paint chip. But the reality is the particles are there. We're just used to looking at this small set of them because those are the ones that darn it can mean the most in a case where you can say these are the target fibers, these are the ones that have this source. But these other particles are there. They're everywhere. So, um, they're very small particles, so let's name them to the VSPs. We don't usually use them. Sometimes we do. We're mostly focused on larger conventional cases. Exception, GSR. We've got some experience in this area. Exception DNA, those are s real small traces. So here's the, the potential and the thing that got me excited once I started thinking about it. Um, you know, look at those particles there. It's a mineral grain on the left and a, a fiber on the right. There, there they are. That's what I want to get at. 
those are my, my particles that I want to say, hey, can I uh, maybe not use them for a particular source? I know where those small particles are, but why can't I use those as multiple transfer evidence in all the cases? So I want to use these fine piggyback particles. They're on the surface of traditional trace evidence, and why not use those to test whether those fibers and their subsequent exposure while we were wearing them after we bought them, whether that can you be used to test that class association further. And then every case becomes a multiple transfer case. So the potential that I see in this, there's um, extensive air monitoring and environmental health experience in this area. We've got the study of respirable or near respirable dusts. We've got frequencies of occurrence that people are studying this, not from a forensic science perspective, and there's plenty that we'd say, oh, that doesn't directly apply, but darn it, this is going on already. There's local monitoring, there's studies of what dusts are present in what city. There's studies of what dusts are in the household. A lot of that's focused on things that aren't going to be directly adaptable, but it is going on. Um, we could use them maybe, for instance, to put a bound on a moderately rare particle. Tracing of airborne part pollutants to their source, automated analysis methods, this is all going on. There's also specific forensic experience in this area in, in GSR. There's people in this room who've been doing this for, um, for 22 years. Rich Brown's been, been already doing this stuff. Dave Exline's been developing instrumentation for it. Um, the folks at Macron Associates have been doing this for a longer still, and the people who have gone through that organization and, and gone elsewhere. But I believe it's a revolutionarily significant that when we're working with complex particle mixtures, co-occurring particles can be used to independently and quantitatively test alternative attribution hypotheses, and we can achieve high levels of individuality that can't be reached through single particle frequency estimates. Now, it's different from a couple of things that might look very similar. It's different from looking for a specific target particles that are based on the case context, regardless of their size, like GSR, right? It's different from that. It's different than monitoring for specific particle types, like the applications looking at these fine particles in environmental hazards and in pollutants and in security threats. It's different from tracing the source of pollutants, where you're looking at a particular target and trying to figure where it goes from. And it's different from determining what's happening at a given site. So monitoring a particular type of, of effluent in order to say what, what might be going on. So what is it? It's, uh, again, I thought I'd name it. Particle combination analysis is the best I could come up with, so PCA. We want to use co-occurring particles to independently and quantitatively test alternative attribution hypotheses. So we thought we'd test this approach, or try to, and uh, we were I greatly appreciate the, the funding that's allowing us to do this. Uh, carpet fibers seem ideal for this purpose. Long-term exposures in one place. Very large exposed surface area on the surface of a fiber. Type of forensic science evidence that's very mature and we all have ways of dealing with it already. They're designed to trap small particles in carpet fibers. And indoor environments are highly variable, as uh, the Petracos, the folks at MVA, have been, um, been studying and documenting this for, for a goodly while. So testing the approach with carpet fibers. Um, started, we've um, developed methods to wash these things off and clean them. We've got unwashed fibers there on the top and the washed ones there. Um, Andy Bowen develops these, these methods uh, in our laboratory. They're not particularly profound, but they're well tested at this point. Um, this slide will be in the, the set here to, um, to, to uh, do for reference if you, if you need them. But here's an example of some of the blanks, the reagent blanks and the process blanks in the top and the uh, samples on the bottom of particles recovered. Now they're ready to, to send off to um, computer-controlled SEM analysis. And you're familiar with the, the, the type of data that you can get from that. It's not ideal data for single, it's not reasonable data for single particle comparisons uh, in forensic science when you're looking at individuality as opposed to identification but it's suitable for something, and if it can get us over this barrier and get us to be able to test the origins of those carpet fibers, that's, that's really nice. 
So the research that's currently underway, we're looking at within and between item variability. If I take this carpet and I go to different places, it's going to be just the same kind of issue with soil, I suspect. You know, I, <laughs> I don't know how close I have to get, but we're testing that. Um, so in this area of the carpet, multiple samples. Let's find out whether these particles are really there and whether they're really useful. Well, they're really there, but um, how useful are they? Um, we have um, nylon carpet fibers that we've uh, standardized or settled on in household environments and automotive environments. And we're testing how likely is a measured particle profile to have originated at a randomly selected, as a randomly selected um, profile from a given population. Um, multinomial distribution, et cetera. Um, so anyway, stay tuned. We, um, we've got the particles, we've got the data, we've got the CCM work done. Uh, David Exline has uh, done that work for us. Uh, Andy's done the work on the uh, isolation of the particles, the, prep the preparation, and he'll be assisting me more than he'd like with the statistics. And um, the project was supported by NIJ, so thank you very much. Appreciate the... I've, at the back of this talk, is when you see the slides, there's a, a series of references that are dealing with some of the issues and covering the environmental uh, aspects of uh, types of studies that are being done, perhaps you might not be aware of, of the, um, um, in the uh, environmental literature. Thank you.